Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Looking now at John's Gospel, chapter 21. John's Gospel, chapter 21. In the weeks leading up to Easter, I spoke from John's Gospel about the pre-resurrection events in Jesus' life, how he taught what he said. And then um, on Easter Sunday, we spoke about the resurrection from John's Gospel, the great thing that God did by bringing him back to life. And now we're looking at, for a few weeks, some of the post-resurrection events in Jesus' life. After the resurrection, yes, in John's Gospel, and we read here in, in John, 15, uh, John 21, verse 15, it'll be on the screens for you. When they had finished eating, and I will refer to this uh, meal in a few minutes, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you. I think they are a better translation. Someone will bind your hands and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Now, that is the way John refers to himself in the gospel as a disciple Jesus loved. It was first century humility, not to mention your own name. So that's almost certainly John. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Last week, we talked about this great idea. It is a great idea that you and I are sent people. Our Lord appeared to the disciples in the same room where the Last Supper was, the upper room. And he said to them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And out of that, when we looked at this last week, we got the idea that it wasn't just for the disciples, it's for all believers that Jesus wants us to be sent people. So he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. As the Father sent Jesus, Jesus is also sending you. We are all sent people. But you know, there are things that are obstacles for us. We have things that are holding us back. We're carrying all kinds of baggage. Things from my past that hold us down. And, you know, the disciples needed to have more instruction, which Jesus was willing to give and which he did give, about how they were to do their ministry and do their work and go out as sent people. And here's what what John has for us. This is the most important thing I'm going to say today. I want you to remember the whole sermon and go home and be able to give it to somebody else, okay? But you probably can't do that. I want you to remember at least this one thing. Let go of the past. Let go of the baggage. Let go of the good past and the bad past. Now, Peter had a good past. He was a fisherman. He was very good at being a fisherman. He was very prosperous at it. We know he was prosperous because in the city of Capernaum, he had a house. He had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. You can't get more, more prosperous than that. Jesus used that that house at Capernaum as his headquarters for the Galilean ministry. And you know what? Archaeologists think they have found that house and they have excavated it. And it was a nice house. Peter was very good at being a fisherman. But one day as he was doing his fishing, Jesus came by the Sea of Galilee, looked at Peter and said, you come and follow me. You've been very good at fishing for fish. Now I'm going to use you to fish for men. That was... Peter's call. That was what Jesus wanted him to do with his life. He was, from that moment on, a man that Jesus wanted to send. Now, when he appeared in the upper room, he emphasized and underscored that initial experience that Peter had. 
I have called you to be a fisher of men. Now I'm sending you, Peter, and all the disciples into the world to be that kind of person, to reach people, to influence people. Now I want to say to you, as we go all through this, that you're a set person too. And it doesn't mean that you're going to stand on a platform like I'm doing right now and preach a sermon. It doesn't mean that you're going to be out there knocking on doors, door to door. Now, that's what God wants you to do. That's a, that's a good thing to do. But I want you to understand that everything you do inside of God's church, to be involved in a ministry of some sort, to work in our preschool, or children's ministry, our youth ministry, to work as, a, as one of our musicians, or to sing in a choir, or a praise team, if you stand outside and shake hands with people, if you work in vacation Bible school, everything you do, you're doing as someone who is a sent person. So God sent Peter. He sent the disciples. He's sending us. What happens is that sometimes our past, our good past and our bad past can hold us back. Now Peter's good past might have been holding him back. He had been a fisherman. Now, I want you to get this. It had been some weeks since Jesus had appeared in the upper room. So I want you to get this. Resurrection, eight days, he appears in the upper room. And we don't know what, how much time, but it was a number of days, maybe some weeks before Jesus appeared to his disciples again. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if Jesus appeared to me one time, that would be enough. But the disciples, they said, well, we're sent men, but what are, we, so, what are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go? How does he want to use us? And, and Peter was beginning to get a little squirmy about it. And so one day he turns to his other friends, his other disciples, his other, several other disciples. He says, I'm going fishing. Are you getting this? I'm going fishing. I'm tired of waiting around from Jesus, for Jesus. I'm, I'm just giving up on him. I want to hear more from him about our mission, what he wants us to do as sent people. But he's not telling us. So I'm going to go back to my old life. I'm going back to fishing. And he goes out. And he fishes. Our Lord says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Now there's been a lot of discussion over the centuries about what the these was. I'm going to get to the bottom line, okay? I think our Lord was talking about the fishing boats and the nets and the fish. Peter, do you love me more than your old life? Because if you do not love me more than your old life, your old life is going to hold you back. It's a good life. But it's going to hold you back from doing all the things that I want you to do as a sent person. Now listen, listen. I'm not saying that as a sent person, God wants you to sell your house, to sell your car, leave your family, and leave everything and go out someplace in the, in, the, in the wilderness and serve him. I'm not saying that. Part of what he is sending you to do is to, is to provide for your family and to put a roof over your family's head. I, I, so I'm not saying that. I, but last uh, year I, I, I preached on uh, what, Paul, what Paul said about being in jail in Rome and then he had a dream of going to Spain and preaching the gospel and that we should have our dreams and not give up on our dreams. So he came to me after the service and said, Pastor, I'm leaving after the service. I'm going to New Guinea. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. You know, he was kidding me about that was his dream. He was going to leave. I'd never see him again. And we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is that you discover as a sent person who has the Holy Spirit, where God wants you to serve, what God wants you to do, and you get involved in that ministry and if your past is holding you back, your good past is holding you back. All the things you were doing, all the things that you had, all the things that you enjoyed, but if it's holding you back, you let it go. Now, Peter had a bad past, too, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. But here it is. Our Lord said in John 13 that I'm going to be crucified. The shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. All of you, my disciples, my friends, you're going to leave me. I will die by myself. And Peter said, now you, you, you know Peter, right? He's hard-headed, impetuous, always runs his mouth. And he said, 
Jesus, that's not going to happen with me. I will never leave you. I will die for you. And Jesus says, you will, huh, Peter? I'm telling you, before the rooster crows tomorrow at sunrise, you will deny me three times. So Jesus is arrested. He's taken to trial before the Jewish high priest and then before the Roman governor. In the darkness, Peter follows Jesus. And three times he's accosted. You knew him. I saw you with him. You're one of his disciples. And three times Jesus, Peter says, no, I did not know Jesus. I'm not one of his. And then the rooster crows. Now Luke tells us that Peter went outside and wept bitterly. I think that when Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, and breathe on him and said, receive the Holy Spirit, that Peter was still carrying that baggage of knowing he had denied Jesus, that he had been a coward. And it made it very difficult for him to let go. It was much easier to go back to fishing. But you see, you have to let go. You have to let go of the things that you have loved if they're holding you back from Jesus. You have to let go of the things where you have failed Jesus. And you also have to let go when people have hurt you. You have scars in your life because of how people have treated you, how you've been abused in various ways. You can't let those things keep you from having the future that God wants you to have. You have to let go. Now, when I was a kid, it was a gardenia bush in the flower bed outside my bedroom. And uh, you may disagree with me, that's fine, but I hate gardenias. I hate them. I hate how they smell. And the window in my bedroom was open in the summertime, and that gardenia smell would come in, and I just, oh, man. Oh. And in the summertime, little black bugs would fly around the flowers. And if you were standing close, they'd get on you too. They're all itchy. I just hated gardenia bushes. One day, my dad decided to take the gardenia bush out of the flower bed. Now, he didn't do it for me. He did it for my mom, so she put more flowers in. So he went outside and dug around the bottom of the gardenia bush, cut the roots that were there. He had me come out and help him. And we thought we had it loose. And we, so we took a, a board and we put down the ground and we began to push the board, try to lever it out of the ground. And we began to pull on it also. And we could not get it out of the ground. So my dad brought the car up. Our family car was a 1956 Chevrolet station wagon. We had three on the tree you know, three-speed transmission, and a, a spotlight on the side. My dad loved that spotlight. He loved to shine it on things at night as we were driving along, you know. He loved that spotlight. So he took a chain, he put it around the trunk of the uh, gardenia bush, and he hooked it onto the bumper of the station wagon. And he revved that thing up, that car up, and he popped the clutch, and he began to pull, and it pulled the bumper right off the car. And then the car sped across our lawn into another flower bed, hitting another bush, knocking off his spotlight. <laughs> he got out of the car, and I'm laughing. I'm laughing so hard I can't stop. I'm almost crying. He looked at me and said, shut up, boy. <laughs> About 20 years or so later, when he couldn't hit me anymore, I started making fun of him about that time, and he never, never laughed. I wish my dad had let go before he messed up his car. But he was chained to it. And you've got to let go of the things of the past, good and bad, which are holding you back from having the experience of being a sent person with something that Jesus has given you to do. Now, i got one word for you. Restoration that Jesus wants to restore you. And I said I'd come back to in a moment that Peter had a bad past that was holding him back, and I referred to it. Our Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter did. And Peter is filled full of the guilt of his denial. And when Jesus really needed him, he turned his back on Jesus and walked away. He had been a coward, and the guilt was in his heart, and it was holding him down. And when Jesus said, I'm sending you out, 
Peter had the bad past holding him back and holding him down. And then Jesus puts him through a process of restoration. And restoration is a process. Repentance is part of that. And I want you to know that Peter was a believer. He said, you are the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He was a believer. But being forgiven of your sin is a good thing. Past, present, and future is a great thing. It's a wonderful, transformative thing. But if you have sinned after you are a believer and you turn your back on the Lord Jesus, you need to be not just forgiven, but also restored. And so um, after this meal, they walk along the beach. Let me explain the meal for us a little bit to you. Earlier in, in chapter 21, you know, Peter said, I'm, I'm going fishing. And they're out fishing. They fished all night long. And they're not catching anything. And then close to dawn, a mysterious figure appears on the seashore. And he yells to them, hey, guys, how's it going out there? You caught anything? No, we haven't caught a thing. Well, I, let me tell you, throw your net on the other side of the boat. So they, they say, okay, we'll do it. What the heck? They throw the net on the other side of the boat. And they catch an enormous amount of fish, 153 fish. John counted them. And I think the reason he counted them is that that uh, these fish, 153, represent the nations of the world, you see, and they're sent to them. So he's acting out their mission, their task. And then John says, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps into the water and begins to swim to the seashore. When they get to the seashore in boat or, fi or swimming, there's a fire. Jesus says, give me some of your fish. And he begins to cook it. Now, I hate fish. I hate fish with a passion. My idea of perdition is Captain George's. <laughs> Ugh. But if Jesus baked me a fish, I'm going to eat it. They have a nice breakfast with Jesus. And then when the meal is over, Jesus says, Peter, come on. Let's go for a walk. And they're walking on the seashore beside the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Now Peter's a little hurt because Jesus asked him three times, you know everything. You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Now I want you to catch this. Three times, three times, Peter denied Jesus. And three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? They parallel. Our Lord was asking for the same kind of committal that paralleled Peter's denial. He's taking him through a process of restoration. Now, Peter, I said, I'm going to send you. Here's my mission for you. You take care of my lambs. You feed my lambs. Those lambs are us, the sheep that belong to Jesus. Peter, will you lead my church? Will you teach my church? Will you help my, my sheep grow? That's my mission, to be the leader of the early church. Will you do it, Peter? Peter says, you know I love you, Jesus. He was going through this process of restoration. It begins with repentance, but that's not enough. Our Lord will lead us through making the committals, making the decisions that take us back to where he wants us to be. Now listen, you may have walked away from Jesus. You may have denied him. You may have betrayed him. And I, I think probably many people watching online, that's where they are right now. But Jesus can restore you. It begins with your repentance, but it continues with you making a decision over and over again. I'm going to stay with Jesus wherever he takes me. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. Now I want to say this just, just because it's on my mind. There are a number of Christian leaders, pastors, other leaders. And I read about this almost every day because I'm, I'm constantly reading about what's happening in the church across America who have fallen into some kind of sin, sexual, financial, some other kind of sin. And they've hurt the church that they're in and they hurt the cause of Christ in America. And they say, I'm gifted, I'm talented. 
I'm absolutely stunningly good looking. That's a burden I have to bear, by the way. (laughs) And the rules don't apply to me. And I have sinned the way I have sinned. And I don't need no restoration. I'm just going to keep on doing my ministry. If my church doesn't want me, I'll go out and start a church someplace else. I'll begin a TV ministry of some kind. You need to repent. And you need to be restored. It doesn't mean that you sin that God can never use you again. But it does mean that you have to come to a place of being humble and accept the punishment Jesus wants to give. You walk away and let Jesus heal you and restore you. That's for us too, friends. It's for us too. Now, I had that test this week that everybody's supposed to have when they turn 50. Although they have moved... Although they've moved the age down to 45. I just want you to know this, right? <laughs> they have. And um, I have to have it every five years because my mother had colon cancer. She was healed of it. She was cured. And she died years later of, of unfortunately, COVID. But the result is I have to have this test every five years. And I want to let you know something. I hate it. I despise it. It's terrible. I had a a massive heart attack and my heart stopped beating. And I don't know which one I hate worse. The heart attack (laughs) or this test, it's 50-50. Now, when I went for the test, I, I wasn't very happy, but I pretended that I was. I talked to the staff. I had a wonderful doctor. Everybody was kind to me. I asked about their background. I told jokes. Everybody everybody thought, oh, he's doing great. No, I hated it. And if I could choose never to go through it, I would choose never to go through it. And so after the test was over with, everything was good, by the way, I I reflected on this because I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to grow. And I'm reflecting on why I hate it so much. And I thought about it for a very long time. And I came to the place of recognizing that it's humbling, almost humiliating. And I didn't like the humbling. I didn't like the humiliation. Which means I got a lot more growth I have to experience under the hand of the Lord Jesus. But I really believe this is why you and I have a problem with hearing the call and saying, yes, it's humbling. Or we are involved in sin. We have a bad past and we can't let it go because it requires us to be humble before Jesus and receive the humble he wants to give us. But I want you to understand that unless you're willing to let go of your past, whether it's good or bad, unless you're willing to be restored by Jesus, if you fall into sin, you're not going to be able to experience the things he has for you that are so good as someone who's a sent person, blessed by the Holy Spirit. Now, one more thing. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't do it. I want you to hear this. There's always going to be somebody better at you than what you are at what you're doing. Yes, there are people who are not as good as you. But don't compare yourself to those who are better or those who are worse. You just do your thing. You do what God's called you to do. Don't worry about anybody else. Let me tell you about preachers. I know a lot of them. Preachers compare themselves to other preachers. As soon as a guy gets up to preach and a preacher's listening to him preach, he says, I can do that better than him. (laughs) Isn't that silly? Isn't that silly? Who cares? Let him do his thing. You do your thing. Now, Peter is walking with Jesus along the beach. And Jesus says to him, let me read it to you again to, to remind you. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you want it, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will bind your hands and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So what happened with Peter was, and Peter was catching on to it, Peter, you're going to be crucified the same way I was crucified. And Peter was. And Peter, this is a big shock. You mean I'm a sent person? 
You got something for me to do to take care of the, of the ch early church? But you want me to be crucified? And so Peter turns around and looks. Now John is following along, eavesdropping. That's how he got the gospel, you know, eavesdropping. And Peter says, well, what about him? What's going to happen to, to, to John? Are you following this? He's comparing himself to John. I got to doubt. What about John? Jesus says, I'll just paraphrase. It doesn't matter what happens to John. You do your thing. John does his thing. Stop comparing yourself. There will always be somebody better. There will always be somebody worse. It doesn't matter what happens to them. So don't you say I'm better than that person, not as good as that person, and oh, I feel superior, I feel inferior. You do your thing, and only your thing, what God has called you to do. The first thing that Jesus says to Peter by the Sea of Galilee three years earlier was, follow me. And the last thing Jesus said to Peter was, follow me. It's perfectly symmetrical. You don't worry about anybody else. You follow me. One of my granddaughters is a very good actress. I think that she may one day receive an Academy Award. And, and she reminds me so much of my two boys when they were growing up. <laughs> this is really funny. Thanks for getting ready to laugh. But uh, if you do something with one of the grandkids, she's watching. He says, you did so-and-so for somebody else, and you didn't do it for me. Who? <laughs> and my boys did the same thing. Joshua Company said, say, you did this for Cal. You love Cal more than you love me. And jo Cal was company. He said, you did this for Josh. You love Josh more than me. And I would say to both of them, this is good parenting, even though you don't think it is. Yeah, you, got, you caught me. I love them more than I love you. <laughs> they go, ooh. I wasn't going to play that game. But she says, you did that for so-and-so. He didn't do it for me. Hmm. Now, that's cute when you're four. Isn't it? But it's not cute when you're 35. It's not special when you're 65. If you compare yourself to other people and say, you didn't do for me what you did for them, then you're never going to be able to be the sent person God wants you to be. You let them have their ministry, but you do your ministry. You let go of your past. If you have been involved in something that has broken you and, and because of your sin, you let Jesus restore you, and he will. And you do your thing. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, right now we're thinking about each of us here, what you are sending us to do. We don't want to, to, to over-exaggerate this and say, I have to give up everything I have and leave. We want to be real about this. That each of us has a ministry, a place to serve and work. Each of us has a role to help reaching people for the kingdom. And when each of us, Father, are a sent person, we will be a sent church. So, Father, is there anything letting us go, holding us back right now? We're letting it go. If there's anything holding us back, Father, right now, we're letting it go. Good or bad. Restore us and use us. We pray we won't worry about anybody else and their calling just our own. Father, maybe this particularly is for those people who haven't yet made a decision about Jesus. You haven't let things go yet. And if you're that person either here or at West Portsmouth or watching online, I pray you'll pray this prayer with me so you can enter into God's kingdom. Now listen, pray this from, the, from your heart. Mean it when you pray it. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands, and I pray you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ has done for me on the cross. And I pray you'll come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might have a relationship with you and know that I'm saved. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, you're part of God's family. Let me know what the card you find in the chair, the form attached to the worship program. 
There's an online counselor waiting for you. Talk to them. Take that form and put it in the offering box in the back or drop it by the welcome desk. We'll stay in touch with you, help you grow in your faith. Heavenly Father, right now, we know, we hear that the Lord Jesus is sending us. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.